salam and peace <clears throat> this is imam malik mujahid and welcome to muslim network television uh, you we you can always watch us on galaxy 19 satellite amazon fire tv and on our website muslimnetwork.tv of course we are all over in youtube and facebook pages uh, we are uh, today talking on the Mujahid talk about something the whole America is talking about. And millions of people around the world are watching us. How do we deal with this? If you don't understand why all these people are protesting across America, maybe we are possibly part of the problem. With 40 million people jobless, in the richest country in America, one in four persons in New York searching for food, one in four, that is 25% of all the population of the largest, largest city in the richest country in the world, and 100,000 people dead, disproportionately African Americans and Latinos and fresh immigrants in New York. At the top of it, the documented murder by police of George Floyd, that served as the last straw. Peaceful protest is winning, although different elements are trying to depict it differently. It's by and large a peaceful protest. I was there this Saturday in uh, in Chicago protest. I have not seen as peaceful, but highly emotional and passionate display of peaceful force. And it is being noticed. It is being noticed by where the money matters. Businesses are coming around. City groups, Netflix, Nike, Twitter, HBO and different departmental stores, they're all coming out, aligning themselves with Black Lives Matter movement. They see money there, I guess. Even President Trump found time to place a call to the brother of George Floyd, except he just kept talking and uh, his brother says that he was not giving any opportunity for response. Even Billy Eilish has sent powerful refutation to the All Lives Matter illogical statement to her 58 million followers. So protest is increasing. Protest is about the use of brutal force by police and how police is responding. Not all, but most, they're responding with more force. That cannot help. There are plenty of videos documenting officers using um, tear gas, paper spray, rubber bullet, rubber bullets. People can get killed by rubber bullets. Not just on protesters, but also bystanders and people going around for their groceries and police car is being weaponized against people. And all of that is being documented. This will not help. Leadership is needed. Reform is needed now, not tomorrow. And that's the call of protest. And if you don't understand why people are standing up, then please take your time to think through. You might be the part of the problem. To discuss all of that with us are three great people. I would request first Hatim Abu Daya, who is leader of the communities in Chicago. Hatim Abu Daya is executive director of Arab American Action Network. Welcome, Hatim. Salam. Thank you, Abdul Malik. 
He is a community organizer and his organization work on youth development, social services, serving Arab communities across Chicagoland. He has been community organizer for 21 years. Uh, and he has helped promote Arab participation in some of the most important social services struggles in Chicagoland. I have been witness to his participation and mobilizing communities across all lines. He has been part of Black Liberation Movement, Freedom for Political Prisoners, Immigrant Rights, Workers' Rights, Police Accountability, and Entire Racial profi Profiling, Women's Rights, and others. Abu Daya is also co-founder and current national coordinator of the U.S. Palestinian Community Network. Welcome to Muslim Network, uh, Hatim Abu Daya. Thank you. I'm honored to be here. Thank, share with me and uh, where the movement is heading. Do you see this movement is moving towards success? Yes, I think there's a, a lot of positive developments here. You mentioned some of them in your introduction. Um, I I look at the uh, the metrics a little bit differently, and I look at the the mass movement. Um, the fact it of the matter is that um, the support for Black liberation in this country um, has been increasing. Uh, over the past few years, especially, um, we at the Arab American Action Network, uh, you know, progressive Arabs uh, in Chicago and in the United States in general, have always had the perspective that in this country, the most important social justice movement is the Black Liberation Movement. And today it manifests itself in the fight for police accountability and the fight against police killings of black people in the United States. And so if you believe in a transformation of society, if you believe in social justice in general in this country, then you have no choice but to understand where the vanguard is and who the vanguard is. And that is the black liberation movement. That is the fight for police accountability in Chicago. Again, more specifically, that fight is for a civilian police accountability council. There's a bill in the city council that says that, that the community should have democratic control of the police, that it should be community members and not the mayor and not uh, an appointed board of professionals, but community members who are the most directly affected by police brutality and by violence are the ones who should be in control of the police to make sure that corrupt cops are not on the force any longer, to make sure that those who perpetrate violence against black people, against Latinx people, against other communities of color and poor communities are no longer able to terrorize those communities. The only way that can happen is if the community has democratic control of the police, has democratic control of hiring a superintendent, has democratic control of making sure that these killer and violent cops are are um, are kicked off the force and and charged with the crimes that they are perpetrating. You keep using the term black liberation movement as compared to black lives matter campaign. Do you differentiate between the two or these are the other names uh, of the current phase of the movement? I think that um, Black Lives Matter, you know, came about as a slogan and even as an institution and as a as a concept in people's minds and in their hearts um, ever since the movement for justice from for Mike Brown in Ferguson. Um, of course, the Trayvon Martin killing, which was not perpetrated by law enforcement, but by a civilian, also galvanized the, the Black Lives Matter movement. I think when I say Black liberation, and when people say Black liberation, it's a broader concept. Um, it's not only about police. 
It's also about socioeconomic issues. It's about economic devastation, unemployment, underemployment, um, horrible education systems, uh, crumbling infrastructure in all of these black and and uh, and a lot of Latino communities across the country. So for the black community specifically, black liberation means economic liberation. It means political liberation. It means independence, um, all of those things. And so the police accountability uh, movement is a, a section of black liberation in general. And our organization and a lot of folks from the Arab community for very, for decades, maybe 30, 40 years, have been supporters of black liberation and have understood that it is the black community that should determine, they should be self-determined to say, this is what we need in our community. This is what we want in our community. This is what we demand for our community. And now that demand is police accountability. Now that demand is civilian control of the police, democratic control of the police. And now that demand is to the, to the police, to the mayors, to the governors, to the president, stop violating our rights, stop killing our people, stop devastating our communities. And tell me this, Hatim, that, um, you know, on this uh, Saturday, there were, of course, every day there are marches. But the march uh, which you were leading uh, started by a couple of layers of cars surrounding several blocks around the Cook County prison system. What, what is the symbolism and the need for that particular action? So it, it, there's, a, there's a lot of parallel issues going on in Chicago around uh, policing around um, prisoners um, in the Black and, and Latino community especially. And so the reason why this protest, which was absolutely incredible, Abdel Malik, I, I know you were down there. Um, we think that there were close to 35 to 45 streets that were filled with cars headed to um, to the Federal Plaza in downtown Chicago. Um, it was uh, essentially a log jam of cars that had signs saying justice for George Floyd, that had signs saying we want a civilian police accountability council now, that had signs that said Black Lives Matter, of course, we had our contingent of Palestinians and Arabs had our Palestinian flags out in solidarity with the Black Liberation Movement and the Black Lives Matter movement. And um, the lead organization, so we, we were our supporters, were, you know, were solidarity organizers and activists with the Black community. The lead organization that led this thing on the local level is the Chicago Alliance Against Racist and political repression. Um, the they that day, the National Alliance Against Racist and Political Repression organized in 22 cities this National Day of Action in Chicago specifically. The reason why we went to the Cook County Jail and we made demands there is because for many years in this city, as you know, there has been vicious torture against black and brown, mostly men, but also women for decades in this in this city. It's considered the torture capital of the world. The police have been torturing and forcing people into false confessions. There are men and women in prison who have falsely uh, confessed to crimes because of torture by criminal police. Yes, the now famous that, name was that Burge, uh, the Burge Burge campaign uh, and in the city. So Chicago police known for the torture and uh, and that, uh, that that was a major campaign. So so when you are surrounding the Cook County Jail, 
uh, was it a statement of solidarity because the call was to, for people to use your blow your their horns and uh, and uh, to sh to give a statement uh, at that level uh, it was uh, but, uh, so 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 probably that was one of the reasons of going around but uh, is there a point about you know the whole system of if you don't have a couple of hundred dollars you, you you cannot be released uh, on bond and what is that bail system connected with that uh, in, in, you know the criminalization right. of the whole system right and so that was the that you know those are the demands and those demands predated the murder of of George Floyd which is you know right now during this covid crisis to allow people to stay in jail when they are there because they're not guilty of any crime. They have only been charged and they have not been able to have their day in court. And the only reason they're stuck in that Cook County Jail is because, right, they don't have the free few hundred dollars to get themselves out. What a criminal system it is when a person who is not convicted of a crime has to sit for months and months potentially in jail amongst all other people in this this enclosed space with COVID-19 disease all around us, basically a, a you know potential death sentence for these people because they're poor and because they can't make bail. And so the, the demand that day included in the demand for justice for George Floyd was to free them all, free all the prisoners who are there only because they can't make bond, free all the prisoners who are there because they were tortured into false confessions. Free all the prisoners who are uh, old and and ill and infirm. We needed we need to get those people out so that they don't contract the virus and the disease in prison and spread it to everybody else that's in jail and in prison. And it's now, a, it's a criminal in response system. to the protests, they're arresting hundreds uh, hundreds of. Uh, protesters and subjecting to the same thing. You're watching Muslim Network TV, and we are always on Galaxy 19 satellite, as well as Amazon Fire TV. And you can always watch us on muslimnetwork.tv. Uh, this is Malik Mujahid, and we'll be right back after these messages. We are justice for all. Headquartered in the heart of downtown Chicago, Justice for All is a global humanitarian initiative dedicated to raising awareness for human rights concerns impacting vulnerable minority groups. We promote policies that protect religious freedom, address the root causes of mass displacement, and recognize the plight of refugees and forced migrants. Our diverse team of staff and volunteers, led by Imam Malik Mujahid, work tirelessly to help Justice for All achieve their goals. Past campaigns covered a wide range of humanitarian concerns. Through Bosnia Task Force, Imams and leaders of Chicago's Muslim community worked to ensure Bosnia became a top national issue. This led to life-saving American policies in Bosnia. A key accomplishment was helping to get rape declared a war crime. Initiatives also included Kosovo Task Force, Central African Republic Task Force, and Flint Coalition, which brought awareness to the water crisis affecting the people of Flint, Michigan. Highlights of our work include supporting Black Lives Matter, Parliament of the World's Religions, addressing climate change. So wasteful consumption starts the ruthless production, and that's where we need all the fossil fuel in the world. Hey. 
and prominent media exposure. This is Imam Malik Mujahid, uh, President of Justice for All. And I'm the Director of Outreach for Justice for All. And that's why we need to go back to what worked. Today Hopefully. we're demanding an apology uh, from the CEO of Costco. The to... Chinese crackdown on Uyghurs and other Turkic people has only gotten worse. Current programs such as Burma Task Force advocate for the rights of Rohingya refugees in Bangladesh, internally displaced populations, and all those denied freedom of movement and at risk of starvation. Through this, we mobilized thousands of calls to elected representatives. This paved the way for the U.S. to increase funding for Rohingya refugees from $30 million to $210 million. Two of our documentaries were featured on international news outlets. The Rohingya People, a slow-burning genocide on BBC World News, and Rohingya Refugees Tell of Massacre was featured on CNN. We've organized rallies, UN mission visits, expanded presentations on campuses, promoted research and report writing, outreach to think tanks, media, and other influencers. Faith Coalition educates about the Rohingya genocide and crimes against humanity faced by ethnic groups in Burma. We've traveled to refugee camps, convened a meeting of Karen, Kachin, and Rohingya leaders both to encourage cooperation and to guide them in congressional outreach. We organized Rohingya Advocacy Day. This led to over 100 participants visiting the offices of 60 U.S. Senators and Congressional Representatives. Free Kashmir advocates for the people of Kashmir. Long-term goals include the call for self-determination, the end of the Indian military's occupation of the territory, and raising awareness of Kashmiri issues among the American people. After the August 5th reinvasion of Kashmir, we organized national protests in front of various Indian government buildings, partnered with Stand with Kashmir, and launched a petition condemning the Gates Foundation's decision to present Prime Minister Modi a humanitarian award. Save Uyghur informs Muslims and neighbors of other faiths about the ongoing cultural genocide of Uyghur Muslims and mobilizes public support. Our projects include boycotting Chinese products with our Fast From China campaign, pushing Bill S-178 in the Senate, and organizing a nationwide protest of Costco. Together, we can continue to stand up for justice. Justice for all. Welcome back to Muslim Network TV, and this is Malik Mujahid, and I'm talking with Hatim Abu Dhaya, and we'd like to also bring in at this moment uh, Esther Kim. Esther Kim, uh, welcome to uh, Muslim Network TV. Thank you. Uh, Esther is a, as you can see, a young Asian American activist and a storyteller is passionate about creating equity and change in our world. Uh, welcome to Muslim Network TV. I, you know, Esther, you were participant in the Chicago protest uh, this Saturday, right? Yes. So what type of people did you see in the protest? I was able to see everyone pretty much, everyone of every single age, religion, color, sexuality. It was quite beautiful, seeing college-aged kids walking alongside parents, walking al alongside children. It was, it was really amazing. Uh, why did you, I mean, as, as Asian Americans in the pandemic, uh, a lot of people have shown their racism towards uh, uh, Asian Americans, uh, accusing them of bringing the virus uh, and things of this nature. So was that uh, in some way part your motivation to participate? Are you motivated in general about the uh, humanity of all human beings? 
I think both because for example, I'm the president of the activism club at our on our college campus, but a large part of it is being Asian American because we are called the model minority and we have privilege. We have privilege and we cannot be complicit and be silent, especially when we're also people of color. We know what it's like to face racism. We know what it's like to have that very sad feeling of just hatred and fear. And so we have to do something about it, especially as Asian Americans. One of the cops in George Floyd's murder was Asian American and he said nothing. He did nothing while the cameras were on him when the country needed him the most. And I think that's also another reason why, because Asian American people need to realize that this is about racism as well. This isn't just one death. This is a repetition. This is a trend and we can't let it be a trend. We need to change history. Do you think um, uh, other Asian American listening to your voice? I think they are because I've been posting on my story pretty religiously and people have noticed, I think. They've noticed what I've been saying and I think some of my friends who normally wouldn't post about it have started to post, which is really cool to see because silence is complacency in this matter. Are you starting to see some people are concerned about violence uh, and don't want to participate in protest any longer? Of course, especially as you mentioned before, it's a mass pandemic, it's scary. So I don't recommend people protesting if someone in their family is immunodeficient or if it endangers other people. But at the same time, I think protesting is very effective and important. Um, people are talking about looting and rioting, but that's vocabulary used to stop protests from happening. Looting is violent, but at the same time, it's how people are able to take back what was taken from them. People can't tell other people, especially Black people, how they should feel or how they should act, especially when the system is wrong. And in a wrong system, you kind of have to do things that will make people notice. And sometimes peaceful protest doesn't cut it. And so I believe that people should express themselves the way that they want to, and that they're completely valid, especially in this unjust society. Um, I, I understand why people feel that way. And sometimes I also, sometimes I also understand their fear, but at the same time, on the same token, it's also important to talk about. So, so there are different theories about uh, how violence is coming about. I mean, when I was there, I didn't see any violence. It was peace, love, care, sharing. And uh, so uh, so one majority of the people are peacefully demonstrating. What it was documented, for example, in Minneapolis uh, is that a peaceful demonstration is going on, one person, who is uh, who has face mask of uh, some uh, some extraordinary uh, thing and umbrella, and uh, he has his equipped with hammer and he's breaking glasses, and that's all he was doing. And uh, so people following him for I think a couple of blocks, asking him, "Who are you? Why are you doing?" And the person remains silent. So there are theories that uh, you know extreme right wing or maybe a gen provocateur are involved in there, but you seems to be uh, implying that uh, it, it could be people themselves uh, who are doing that. Uh, so Hatim, do you agree with uh, what uh, what she her opinion is on this matter? So I'll say you know I agree with Esther when she describes the the uh, the feelings of protesters and the feelings of people from the black community especially um, we are in unqualified um, uncritical support and solidarity with the movement um, for justice for George Floyd and you know what the however that manifests itself in the most affected community going out, and protesting um, is is the, is their right, and I 
you know, I fully understand those those feelings of anger and wanting to make change. But I will say, say that in Chicago and in Minneapolis especially, because we know the leadership of the organizers in, in Minneapolis as well, that the, the Chicago Alliance Against Racism and Political Repression, which organized these 20,000 people in Chicago for the protest, um, the, the violence was started by the police. The protesters were marching. There were some people marching, trying to be socially practice social distancing and marching from the Federal Plaza through the streets, headed east towards um, Lakeshore Drive. Um, at one point, they moved towards the, the Trump Tower. They wanted to protest the Trump Tower. They wanted to protest the racism that we have seen from this president for four years and his administration. And when they went there, one of the lead organizers that I know personally was beaten with um, a police baton. And a number of others were beaten by the police because the police care more about private property than they do about black people and other people of color in, and other oppressed people and poor people in this country. So I saw with my own eyes because I had pulled up in my car right on Kinsey Avenue near near the Trump Tower, I saw with my own eyes the riot shields, the riot gear that the cops were, were wearing, pushing the men, women, and children away from that building and, and beating protesters and beating the, the, the leaders that they knew were leading that march. So I know personally with my own experience, with my own eyes, that of those 20,000 people that were down there, those in their cars, like you, Malik, and me, and all those people by foot, that the violence was perpetrated and initiated by the police. And so those 1,400 people that were arrested on that day and yesterday and Sunday as well, we demand that they are all released immediately and that all charges are dropped immediately and that Mayor Larry, uh, Lori Lightfoot calls off her police dogs against our communities and our um, our friends in the black and, and Latino and other communities that are protesting. So, so do you think the police using the same thing which people are protesting against, that is the police violence, is it a thought, uh, thought out a strategy on the part and the uh, mayor of the city of Chicago herself being black and progressive, she given it a 20, 30 minute notice to put a curfew. Is it going to be uh, helpful in, uh, in, in continuity, in, in, in continuing the peaceful protests or this is a technique which is going to force people more towards the uh, path of violence. You're watching Muslim Network TV. We're on Galaxy 19 satellite as well as Amazon Fire TV and Raku TV. And of course, on Facebook and on our own website, muslimnetwork.tv. We'll be right back after these messages.
Welcome back to Muslim Network TV. This is uh, Malik Mujahid from uh, talk, uh, at, at the talk show name uh, Mujahid Talks. Uh, Esther, uh, you as a young uh, American activist uh, and a storyteller, how do you incorporate this in your art so it become a source of education for a whole lot of people? Because I know Asian American as a privileged community, um, uh, you know, and and moving to suburbs and living a life uh, of uh, their choice uh, need to be educated. And uh, we cannot postpone education when uh, 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 when time are a little calmer and things like that. So what are you doing now to use your art of storytelling to educate people about their responsibility to stand up for Black Lives Matter? Because if if, if Black Lives are not matter, it means uh, no life is matter. I 100% agree. I, I think that people get confused with the hashtag. They don't understand why it's only Black Lives Matter. But exactly as you said not all lives matter until black lives matter as well and especially because i've come from a suburb and i've seen so many types of people the people the high school that i went to people are very i don't want to talk badly of them but they have a lot of privilege and that is a fact um and so by talking about issues like this and by placing responsibility on everyone i think it's an amazing time to be alive. Um, activism is very important to me. And in terms of my art and storytelling, there are so many ways to tell stories. There are videos, there are paintings, there are Instagram posts, there are stories on your Instagram story. There are so many ways to talk to people. And I think that is extremely power in this digital, this digital era. And so I think that it's important to talk about this for example, I think you can do it in your daily life and what you do as your profession. And so, for example, right now I'm an RA or a resident assistant on campus, and I try to highlight these issues or I try to highlight it with my club and working together with other people on our campus to fundraise. Um, I like to make a difference within the country, but also individual communities and our college campus. It's really important to talk about race and racism um, especially in an educational setting and also fundraising for individuals and fundraising for places that people can donate to. I think that's the way that I want to tell stories. Well, um, we are talking with Esther Kim, uh, who is part of the movement in Chicago. And I would like to bring into conversation at Muslim Network TV now, Aliza Griffin. Aliza, welcome to... Muslim Network. Thank you. Eliza Griffin is a rising sophomore at Loyola University of Chicago. She interned with Vox uh, Atlanta, a local journalism organization uh, led by teens for two years, uh, during which an article, uh, her article was published by NPR Atlanta station, WABE. She joined the Black Lives Matter protest in downtown Atlanta following the murder of George Floyd. How was the protest in Atlanta? It was incredible. Um, from what I heard, the protest was organized in four days, um, started by a 19-year-old beauty school student. And it's so amazing to see what we can accomplish when we assemble and that hundreds, if not thousands, honestly, it was too many to count um, from what I saw um, were able to come out in only in only four days. Um, and everyone was completely peaceful when I was there. Um, I was there for two and a half hours and it was just an amazing show of democracy. And of course, emotions were high, but everyone was completely peaceful and, you know, understandably angry and hurt. But it was just everyone came together. And, you know, like Esther was saying, it was all different races, religions, sexualities, and it was just, it was beautiful. Now you used the word beautiful. And uh, beautiful, peaceful, but who do you think is turning it uh, into something different? So 
from what I've seen, it's a lot of paid agitators, um, undercover cops, like Esther was saying, um, and white supremacists or white anarchists who just want to wreak havoc because they see an opportunity um, to kind of just, you know, burn some buildings, burn some cars, break glass, and they're opportunists. And so they take that opportunity to do just that. And um, and also the police um, instigating force. And like you were talking about how um, we are protesting the very use of force and for them to come back at the peaceful protesters with this level of force is just, it's really telling of what actually is going on in America today. Do you think uh, if protests remain more peaceful, it will involve more people or uh, as compared to, uh, you know, as in some places as a result of police uh, violence or as a result of somebody else doing things? So do you think participation will increase movement? Will this strengthen if it remains peaceful? I think so. I think um, because the media has been telling this narrative, as you've been saying, of this kind of violence and, you know, what is happening to America, just showing cities burning and all of these things. And so that kind of scares people away and it's this sort of fear mongering. And so I think if the media shows a different side, um, because when I was in Atlanta, the protests like I was there for two and a half hours and there were news cameras everywhere there were helicopters um, with the news and so there were people from these stations uh, there the entire time but they didn't show the peaceful side of the protest they just showed when things started to get ugly which as we've discussed um, wasn't even entirely or even at all um, the protesters so this 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 is one of the question I have. I mean, you 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 have this track of being a journalist. How what what people can do right now to keep media narrative focus? All what is happening is because of police violence, and police violence is going to worsen this situation, not improve the situation. How this narrative could be a dominant narrative? They're not showing the peacefulness of the demonstration and what you both felt was beautiful. All people were together, it was pretty diverse and everybody felt their part of changing our system as compared to uh, media showing uh, some fire and some looting. How can we work on the media narrative? Um, I think that we just have to be educated and aware. Um, I think that social media has been a really great force for good, um, as well as some bad too. But from what I've seen, there are countless videos of what's actually happening either with um, the outside agitators or with the peaceful protesters. And so I think that as the people being educated and being aware and showing videos that the media might not share themselves. Um, I think that's very, very important. And so that people can see not just this one narrative, but um, many different narratives that are still very, very important to the entire, um, context, the entire story. In, in Atlanta, actually, there is a, uh, the, it was live on TV when Atlanta Police Department broke a car window Mm -hmm. slashed tires of that thing, tased both passengers and arrested both of them uh, for nothing right. and ripped them out of their car. I mean, they, this is this was on live TV, which was it being shown. Yeah. So police violence uh, to which the whole country is standing up and criticizing, including uh, banks and corporate entities, are essentially they are doing the more 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 of the same thing. Uh, so, so in this way, it is becoming a sort of uh, a, a very dangerous cycle, uh, which will probably encourage more violence instead of reducing it. So, Esther, uh, thank you so much for being with us. Uh, let me bring in. Uh, uh, Hatim Abudaya, who is the leader of the protest in Chicago, and uh, talked with Alisa also for a few uh, more minutes. So, what else did you see over there uh, uh, in Atlanta? 
in Atlanta. Um, so I actually was in the middle of, um, so I got there about 15 minutes after everyone had started marching. And so it was right between um, Centennial Olympic Park and um, the Capitol. And so we marched to the Capitol and then we marched back to um, Olympic Park. And then at that point, I was with my stepdad and he um, received word that they had started tear gassing in other places. And so that's when we um, decided to kind of leave the main area um, because there were a lot of um, exit routes. And so we just decided to get out of that main area. Um, but then as we were walking back, we um, we found a parking deck to look over the main uh, CNN area, which is where everything was happening later that night. Um, and it was hours before CNN was, uh, the center was broken into. Um, and we were looking over everyone um, in the crowd and it was very clear that at that moment, tensions started building between the police and the protesters because um, the police had started weaving into the crowd and kind of getting in everyone's faces. And um, there was some water thrown and just, um, and that's when the police started announcing that if they didn't disperse in three minutes that they would start arresting people. Well, Hatim, isn't the mayors of Minneapolis and Chicago and New York and Atlanta are Democrats? A couple of them are uh, uh, African-American themselves. And how come in these cities, uh, police is doing these things? As our guests were saying that she received a text from the mayor 15 minutes before the curfew time. And uh, in New York, uh, you know, mayor is defending police cars, you know, uh, driving into protesters. Of course, protesters were blocking police cars, uh, but using that particular method. Uh, so, so, and where do the Democratic mayors stand in terms of keeping the focus on the narrative that it is against police violence and protesters are peacefully protesting as compared to uh, it is about law and order from the police perspective. Yeah, I, it, listen, I, I think it's it needs to be made clear and I, I think it's already clear to the majority of us that this isn't uh, you know an issue of Democrat or Republican, right? Like even when you know President Obama was in office the police were still killing black people with impunity um, and violating the rights of people across the country with impunity. People of color, black, Latinx, uh, native, poor white people, like that's what ha happens regardless of who is the mayor and what political party she's from. So, you know, I'll, I'll say one of the things that the police think will happen or that the mayors think will happen is, is if there's repression from the police, which we've seen in Minnesota, you mentioned it yourself, rubber bullets that are used by the Israeli military against Palestinians in Palestine that are protesting um, were fired on protesters in Minneapolis. Rubber bullets and tear gas um, uh, were, fi were uh, you know, fired uh, against protesters in Minneapolis. Tear gas was used against the protesters in Chicago too, and 1,400 of them, maybe more now, arrested. The police think that that is going to repress the, the, the protest. It's going to keep people from coming out, and that's absolutely untrue. More and more people are going to want to be out there now because they want to say, you cannot stop us from practicing our democratic right to protest this killing and killings in general. We, we demand a civilian police accountability council, the lead organization in the protests. Again, the Chicago Alliance Against Racist and Political Repression has been working on this campaign for community democratic control of the police for years, has been working on the campaign to get these tortured Men and women. Uh, wasn't it something which uh, the mayor uh, promised before election? 
Well, you know, she made a lot of promises. And one of the things we have to take into consideration is that Lori Lightfoot comes from that police aristocracy. She used to work for the city as a, a, a police board member. So she never came into this campaign for mayor. And even when she won, being a, a, a person of from the community and of the community, yes, she's a black woman. And, and yes, you know, um, that we would maybe expect that that would uh, guide her her politics and that sort of thing. But that's not what the people from the black community in Chicago had seen from her in the, in the past. And that's not what we're seeing from her today. Um, is she better than, you know, white, a white supremacist like Donald Trump? Yeah, absolutely. Is she better than these um, white supremacists who are marching on state capitals with, with guns and calling for, you know, there's, quote unquote, civil liberties. Yeah. But when it comes down to it, you know, the, the mayor controls the police force. The police force is an apparatus of the state and their job is to stop us from protesting, to repress our democratic rights. That's what they're trying to do, regardless of whether it's a black mayor or a democratic mayor or whatever. And our the leadership of the protests in Chicago are saying, no, we're not going to allow that. We're demanding that you release the prisoners, the, the protesters. I'm sorry. We demand that you drop all the charges and you, we demand that you allow us to do what it is, what is our constitutional right to do, which is to protest this murder and the murders across the country over many years of black people um, by the police. Alisa, what do you see in Atlanta? Are, you know, what is people's uh, protesters feeling about the mayor there? Um, I would say most people are very supportive um, because I don't know um, if you've seen, but she made this talk about how she's angry with what's happening to um, our city because of the rioting and the looting. Um, and she said, this is not Atlanta. And um, as we found out later, most of, most if not all of the agitators were outside agitators. So they are not Atlantans. Um, and she, and most people stood behind her. They said, yes, the, like we cannot turn to this form. Um, we cannot let these outside agitators um, destroy what we are trying to um, what are, we are trying to do, what we're trying to protest. Um, but at the same time, you know, we have to kind of understand that, um, this has been a long time coming. And as you were saying, this is kind of the last straw. And so we, um, especially as non-black people can't blame, um, protesters for how they are expressing themselves and how they are, um, protesting because, this isn't just about one murder or about four murders. This is about so many decades of oppression and disenfranchisement of Black people in America. So as, uh, you know, you're a journalist, so what do you think uh, our people who are watching this show can do so the narration remain that this is because of the police violence, it is because of the systemic racism in this society, what individuals can do to keep the narration uh, narrative on the right uh, path? Um, yeah, I think, like I was saying earlier, um, just staying involved on social media and kind of do your own research on different news networks instead of just relying on one and make sure to, um, if there are videos that the media isn't showing, um, to spread them and kind of educate people within your own circles. Like if your family is saying, um, if they're just kind of following blindly what the media is putting out there and just this one narrative, kind of having that conversation with them and making sure that you stay educated and they stay educated um, because 
the most important thing to do um, as non-Black people is to educate ourselves and reflect on how we could perpetuate the system. And so um, just staying aware and staying educated, donating um, is just very, very important. Uh, Hatim, we've got just a couple of minutes. Uh, tell me this. Uh, I mean, I started with this question, but that question remains in my mind. You know, when uh, uh, any mass shooting happens, everybody stands up in the country and uh, criticizes that. And then, uh, then in a few days, that is gone. And, uh, and uh, you know, it happens again, and we talk about it for a few days. Nothing changes. I mean, you have been in the trenches. You have been an organizer for 21 years. What are the things do you think people who are really concerned about the systemic racism in the world, society and killing uh, of uh, uh, black people should do now? So the movement continuously built towards the systemic changes. What are the few things which you suggest people do? Listen, uh, Abdulmatic, you know, <clears throat> it's it's natural that there is a, a, a surge that happens in the mass movement when when there's a murder like this, especially when it's caught on video and it's so clearly criminal. Um, so it's understandable that there's a surge and it's understandable that that surge is going to wane at some point. Uh, what's important to understand is that the people in the black community and the institutions in the black community around police brutality specifically and around police murders of black people specifically have been doing this work for years and years and years. You only see the most quote unquote exciting elements of it at moments like this when there's huge protests around the country. But the rest of the organizing is done very quietly. It's done by mass mobilization. It's done by petition drives. It's done by forcing this community uh, police accountability, civilian police accountability council and to the city council in Chicago. Um, there are these CPAC bills that are popping up in other cities because of the organizing of the Alliance. So the Alliance has formed, and we were co-founders of the, we as in the Arab American Action Network, were co-founders of the National Alliance Against Racist and Political Repression. And that's the formation that organized those 22 protests on Saturday. We'll continue to organize protests throughout the next weeks, but also are doing their really difficult, diligent, community-based, base-building work to, to continue to make change, real systemic change. And that real systemic change right now has to be democratic civilian control of the police. Everyone should go to naarpr.org to see what's happening in all the other cities around the country, including Chicago, and understand that the demand is for the police to stop killing black people, but the demand is also for community, civilian, democratic control of the police so that these things don't continue to keep happening and that we don't have to go out and protest another police killing of a black person in this country. Well, thank you so much, Hatim Abudaya. I truly appreciate uh... Uh, you coming on our show on Muslim Network TV. And thank you so much, uh, Eliza Griffin. And uh, we have in our studio Esther Kim. Thank you so much. Truly appreciate. Uh, this is Malik Mujahid, uh, host of this show. We are for the change. We are for a peaceful change. We are for peaceful marches. Police is the one who caused these protests and police continuously using violence to stop the peaceful protest. All of that must stop and reform cannot wait. Reform is needed now. Thank you so much. We are always on uh, muslimnetwork.tv as well as Galaxy 19 
Satellite, Amazon uh, Fire TV, and Raku TV. And thank you for uh, Zahra Nadim, uh, our producer today. And as a backup producer, thank you, Connor. Uh, thank you so much. Peace. Salam. Thank you, Abdul Malik. You're my brother. Take care. Thank you so much for having me.